Well, hello there, fellow Sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On today's episode, we're going to be focusing on the good, the bad, and the downright disturbing of sports and fandom. So smear your body paint, grab your pom-poms, don your jerseys, and let's meet out in the parking lot for a drunken fistfight. I'm Pastor Shane. I'll be your mascot today as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> This is to me the best stretch of time of the calendar year. The weather cools, the holidays are upon us one after the other, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and it all kicks off with football, which is undoubtedly the most popular sport in America. It is America's pastime. Baseball's heyday was in the age of radio, and understandably, as it's a perfect sport for the radio. It's slow and focused on one thing at a time, which makes it easy to follow with the ears. But on television, that slowness can come off as boring, and the focus nature of the action makes everyone else look inactive, which is not very interesting. And nobody wants to see high-definition video of people scratching their groins and spitting. I do kind of like how the managers are fully decked out in a uniform, as if these old, overweight, schlubby guys are going to jump in and play at any moment. You're the coach. You don't need to dress like the players. It looks silly. And I think that's an interesting thing. I think baseball's cultural decline in popularity is due to the fact that it's not well suited for the medium of the age. It's a bygone sport for a bygone era, and so it'll never return to its preeminent spot in our culture. Basketball is better suited for television, and so it has its moments in the sun. But basketball is also more star-driven. It's more personal. You can really see the players. And an individual can dramatically change the dynamics of the team, which is not as true for football. Uh, you could have a star quarterback, you know, the most important player on the field, but if he has no one to throw it to, or if he has turnstiles for linemen, it's not going to matter much. And what's more, the biggest stars don't play all phases of the game. You know, the quarterback doesn't play defense or special teams. So football is more team-oriented, basketball is more player-oriented, and because of that, the popularity of basketball hinges more on the popularity of the stars. And in this day and age, athletes are particularly polarizing and unlikable, which makes basketball more polarizing and unlikable. Hockey is fun, but it's more regional, and the fast pace and the dynamics of the sport make it a challenge for television. Soccer has never had a cultural hold for Americans. It's a sport for children, women, and poor countries. Uh, people like golf, tennis, boxing, UFC, and motorsports, uh, but those are either not team or less team-oriented, and so they don't produce the same level of fanaticism. Nobody is showing up shirtless in body paint for a golfer or tennis pro. And so for all of these reasons, I, I don't think it's surprising that football is our culture's most popular sport. And for our purposes, I think it's worthwhile to consider how the medium affects us. The product can be fine, but what works for the radio may not work for television. What works for television may not work for the internet. What works for the internet may not work for the page. It's a good lesson that we need to be mindful of in our engagement. But all sports are far more interesting, far more engaging, and far more fun if we're approaching it from fandom. A dispassionate viewing, a viewing with no rooting interest is not really the same thing. I mean, that's not fun. The level of passion, the level of fandom increases the level of enjoyment and engagement. Everything becomes more exciting and tense and frankly fun. But passion and zeal is an expression of the heart. And so to have your heart attached to something that isn't God, that isn't Christ, is a clear danger. The Bible doesn't talk much about sports, and to the extent that it does, it usually has a positive illustration for us. It says in Corinthians, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. 
And the running a race analogy is often repeated. Hebrews, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There's lots of helpful illustrations from sports. I've used tons of them in my sermons. Sports are great examples of determination and perseverance and dedication and adversity and victory. But all of those helpful illustrations and analogies are about engaging in sports, not watching sports. Now, for the record, I'm technically an undrafted free agent, but just like me, most of our engagement with sports is not so much in playing, but in watching it. Not as athletes, but as fans. And although the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about sports, it does have quite a bit to say about idolatry. And there is clear religious overtones in sports. We build these big, beautiful cathedrals, you know, very much like the temples of the pagans, you know, the temple of Artemis or the temple of Apollo, big imposing structures that defined a region. And we gather into these temples and we shout and cheer and cry and there's a, a liturgy, there's dress, there's rituals, there's chants, there's songs. It's all very religious. There's even the devil. Human beings are inclined to worship. We're meant to worship. We're actually naturally religious. And so in an increasingly secular society, that inclination finds an outlet in sports. And more and more, sports is an expression of our worship. Which leads me to today's sponsor. Appropriate in the Culture is brought to you by The Modern Atheist. I don't worship God. That's silly. I worship laundry. I don't worship a being that doesn't exist. That's ridiculous. Instead... I'm going to worship a person that doesn't know I exist or care about me in the slightest. Modern atheists, our lives are sad. Alrighty, so uh, is there any place for Christian fandom or is it all merely an expression of pagan worship? Well, like so much in Christianity, it's all about the condition of the heart. I'm a Bills fan. I love watching the games. I get together with my extended family. We have a modified pick em league and we compete against one another. So I'm invested in the games and it makes it exciting and nerve wracking and intense and fun. And I feel great when the Bills win. I feel bad when they lose. So there is a heart attachment there. There is a love there and that does need to be kept in check. But the problem is not that we love things. God created things for us to love, and God commands us to love things in addition to him, like loving one another. That's actually kind of important. And God made us to be creative, and sports is an expression of that creativity. We made up these games, and made up these rules, and I think God gets a kick out of seeing all the silly games we come up with, because in that way, it's an expression of him. You know, sports are yet another manifestation of us being made in the image of God. The problem is not that we love things. The problem is about degree and preeminence. Even the things that we're commanded to love needs to be in proper relation with God. It needs to be in the right order. Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, God tells us to honor our fathers and mothers. God tells us to love our spouses as we love ourselves. God tells us to love our children and care for them. But the point is, the order of these things matters. God will suffer no rivals. And that's for our good, because loving anything more than him is loving something infinitely lesser. And not only are we capable of loving ourselves or loving our family more than God, we're capable of loving sports more than God. The people will literally skip church because a football game is on. And that tells you what they're interested in worshiping. Or people will skip church because their kids are involved in a league. Well, that tells you where their priorities are. You know, Jesus said, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it can be too much. It can occupy too much space in my head and in my heart. You know, I'm, I'm listening nonstop to podcasts. I'm constantly looking at power rankings and getting in fights with strangers on the internet. And you can get to a point where you're like, man, if I were half as obsessed with the word of God or half as dedicated to prayer as I am to my team, I'd be much better off. We need to examine that. It's okay to love things, but it can never supersede the greatest commandment to love the Lord our God. And if we're not doing that right, then we need to stop and repent.
And it also cannot supersede the second greatest commandment to love others. The order of things matters. You know, men especially can be so wrapped up in sports that they uh, ignore their spouse, or they can be so emotionally tied to a game that a loss can cause them to lash out at even their own family. Uh, if we're doing that, we need to stop and repent. We need to love people more than we love a game. It's okay to love things, but in every aspect of our lives, we need to hold it up to God to see if it's superseding our love of Him, if it's taken the place of prime importance in our lives. The rooting interest and fanaticism is what makes watching games fun, but it can easily bend to worship. I think a good way to mark that is to examine whether or not we're taking it playfully and lightly. And you see it, you know, fanaticism is often a little tongue-in-cheek with, you know, with the body paint and the costumes. It's silly and playful. And costumes might be a good illustration here. You know, some Christians do have a problem with Halloween. Maybe we'll talk about that as we approach it. But the problem centers on the fact that people dress up in dark and scary costumes and they decorate with ghoulish imagery. But I think most people would agree that there's a difference between whether we're approaching the creepy and ghoulish playfully versus approaching the dark and the ghoulish in all seriousness. And I think the same is true for fandom. When it starts getting serious, there's a problem. Anyway, that'll do for today. Go Bills! And as always, you can reach out to me on Facebook, Twitter, or Locals for any questions or comments, and I'll see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture. Music